Hello and welcome to a fascinating and potentially life-changing episode of the Executive Wellness Unplugged podcast. I am your host, Lisa Kelly. Now in today's discussion, we're going to explore the gut-brain connection and how optimizing it can really help enhance executive well-being and their performance. However, as with all our podcast episodes, today's presentation offers wellness-enhancing insights and tactical strategies that really everyone and anyone can benefit from. And my guest today is Melody Biblo, a fellow holistic nutritionist from the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition, and she's also a graduate of our workplace wellness certification programs, including our Certified Executive Wellness Coach course. Now, she has since joined our faculty and actually worked, along with another graduate, worked with me to deliver a six-month executive wellness coaching contract during the pandemic, where we work with eight hospital executives. And you can actually learn more about that. It's profiled in my book, Cultivating Healthy and Vibrant Workplaces. As well, if you want to learn more about us, you can certainly connect with us on LinkedIn or visit the show notes and we'll may have a little bit about our bios there as well. And also, I think, um, you know, if you look a little more into our background, you'll see that we've got a, a, quite a depth of training and then Melody, you'd probably agree, I think, to, to make us fairly qualified to speak on this topic today, right? So welcome, Melody, to the podcast. Thank you, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And so let's just dive right in. And also, just before I go further, uh, we do have an interview that Melody and I did actually speaking about that contract I just mentioned with the hospital. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel, Workplace Wellness Center of Excellence. Now, before we go any further, we do need to make this health disclaimer and advise that, you know, as always, the information we're sharing is really just for educational and informational purpose, purposes only. It's not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And so as always, seek the advice and support of your physician or other qualified health providers. You know, with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition, a health concern, or maybe something that we share here today. So if you think you have a medical emergency, please, please, please call your doctor right away or again, seek your emergency services. So what is the gut-brain axis or connection? You'll hear sometimes it refer both, to both ways. Well, as it says on the screen here, it's really a bi-directional communication network that links the gastrointestinal tract to the brain and central nervous system. And so on this screen, you'll see, um, and I'll describe it for those who may be listening and not watching the video presentation, but the vagus nerve starts, as you can see, um, you know, at the, with the brain, runs right down through the esophagus and goes and connects into the stomach and also innervates and connects with other vital organs as well, as you'll see. And I've read actually too that it may break off and run bilateral on the body. So there was reference to a left and right vagus nerve. So I don't know, Melody, if that's new to you. It was a little bit new to me that it kind of branched off like that. Well, it's quite extensive and because it does connect with so many of the different organs yeah. and throughout the digestive tract as well, um, it it just that does make sense. I mean yeah. it's, it's not well, just one it's not just one one, know, one, one, one one nerve, yeah, 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 for sure. But what's really interesting, and you might have heard this again if, if you know if you know anything about the vagus nerve, that it's really often thought of as our second brain, because it involves, you know, various neural hormonal and immune pathways. And, you know, it really does act as a primary channel through which the gut and brain exchange signals. So Melody, I'll let you speak to this if you want to add further. But what's really interesting here, when we say bi-directional, it means that things we eat, you know, can affect our energy, our mood, right? And also what we think, our thought process, our emotions can directly influence our digestive processes. So that's what we say when we say bi-directional. It goes both ways between the stomach and the brain. Is there anything you'd like to add or clarify to that, uh, Melody? 
Well, I think it's also important to note as well, and we'll, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but um, a lot of the hormones that, you know, they're all sometimes referred to as neurotransmitters, mm -hmm. they're actually manufactured in the gut and they right. travel up the vagus nerve and then have their functions in the brain. So it's not just a one-way uh, communication path. I mean, our, our bodies are so amazingly adaptive yeah. to at every single second. I mean, that homeostasis, it's also our nervous system is constantly like reading the room, reading your, yeah. your thoughts, like, and all this interpretive data goes both ways, yeah. right? And, so, you know, you, you just, sorry, you just brought up something that came to mind that our body is always want to try, tries to be in homeostasis. It always tries to heal itself. It wants to be healthy, right? Right. Well, and I think, I mean, there's two parts to that as well, if you want to think about it. I mean, the homeostasis is the continuous rebalancing of the blood pH, um, the amount yeah. of minerals that are circulating to perform all these functions and enzymatic um, functions and you know when when those building blocks are there and available mm -hmm. and that's the other critical thing and we'll get to this later too you know as part of this the gut issue and if there's mm -hmm. um, dysbiosis if the nutrients and the building blocks are not available for that healing and repair process right that's going to become very slow yeah. or really just impaired um, entirely so so yeah, and looking at the whole picture, I think is is kind of where we, yeah. And you know, I think as, um, the holistic, you know, holistic practitioners, we look at the body um, a little bit differently than say a conventional medicine um, doctors who specialize in neuro health or specialize in gut health. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've ever heard of a, you know any of my clients ever being referred because they've all, all been to specialists before they get to us typically. Mm -hmm you know, a neurologist <laughs> referring somebody to a GI specialist or, or vice versa, you know, to, to really look at the interconnectedness. Yeah. And so I think this is, you know, I think it's a fresh perspective for, for some of you that maybe don't have or haven't had the opportunity to work with, um, say a naturopathic um, doctor or holistic nutritionist or traditional Chinese medicine doctor. I mean, we, we just have a different view on things yeah. and, um, put extra appreciation or emphasis on the fact that there's so much interconnectivity yeah. between all of the different systems, the organs and all their functions because they rely on each other. Yeah. 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 And, and we're really trying to heal the whole entire body, you know, because everything from your spleen to your liver, to your stomach, to your intestines, they're all interconnected. When one's in balance, it can throw the other one out of balance and so and so on. For those yeah. who, you know, know Chinese well, medicine, right? Exactly. And, you know, and there is quite, you know, there's, there's one philosophy too, that all, all disease begins in the gut, mm -hmm. so, but, but it's, that's not in its isolated um, form either, you know, cause stress impacts the gut. Yes. What you eat impacts the gut, you know, all, all kinds of other things impact yeah. the gut as well, but right. it does seem to be a, a central part of, um, and if you heal the gut components and the gut function, and just optimize that a lot of the other issues yeah. in the body tend to resolve themselves. Yeah. I was just quickly, I was just listening the other day to a podcast and uh, maybe it was Mark Hyman or someone I believe who most of us know. And he said, you know, yeah, like when he was working with clients and treating different diseases and conditions, he said, like, they started to say, Oh, and by the way, this cleared up and that cleared up, even though that wasn't the specific intention. And he said, I'm never surprised now when they tell me that, because I just know that's what happens. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Depending yeah. on the severity of the condition. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, let's just take this a step further in terms of looking at the con connection of the gut brain health to our overall health, things we've just spoke on, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as you said, you, you mentioned the neurotransmitters and that 80 to 90% of serotonin, right? That helps regulate our mood and our digestive system is made in the gut. And right. we're going to, you know, talk about the microbiome and the gut microbiota, you know, biota and how it affects brain health. And Melody, I'll probably let you explain that a little bit further in just a second. And as we talked about, like stress and digestion, anxiety, all this can impair our gut health 
and contribute to things like IBS and GERD. And I'm going to share a little bit more about my experience and my story a little later on um, and LPR, which I currently am um, addressing. And, you know, um, yeah, and the chronic inflammation connection, right? And in the gut can really lead to systemic. So again, it's everything we talked about. Everything is is connected, right? And our diet and our mood, it all has an impact on how we, we we're thinking and our overall health, you know, our gut health and everything. So would you like to just speak about the microbiome? And, because I know you can probably do a really good job in explaining that and why that's important that we talk about that today. Well, I think the microbiome is, I mean, I think it's the last decade or maybe even 20 years now. I mean, the, the time just flies, right? But uh -huh. there's there's been a massive worldwide um, research project really looking at the gut microbiome and the different roles that different strains of, mm -hmm. of these bacteria have like there there's actually more of them than our own human cells yeah like so, trillions i've heard trillions, trillions, trillions. trillions. <laughs> and it's not just they're not just in our gut either yeah. they're in our brain they're on yeah. our skin they're they're everywhere they're, they're symbiotic with us yeah and you know, so we do have to really help nourish them. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, there's things that we've, we've done throughout our lives um, that actually can damage that. Yeah. So Penicillin, and, and, uh, antibiotics being one of them, number, right? Number one. Yeah. And, um, but even things like, you know, not having the right dietary components, you yeah. know, how do you feed and nourish them? Yeah. Um, but, you know, not having the building blocks either, you know, for, you know, for making neurotransmitters, just for you know, one quick example, um, all of our hormones require um, fats, well, mm -hmm. cholesterol in particular, mm -hmm. but they're also building blocks made from proteins. Yeah, you know, so there's there really, really um, puts a lot of emphasis on what you eat. Yeah, you know, really well, becomes the fuel and the building blocks for mm -hmm. how well everything else functions as well. So if you've got gut dysbiosis you're not digesting your food properly you're not getting your nutrients you're not getting you know the mm -hmm. whole system supported properly so this yeah. is where why it's it's so important to emphasize that this is a key place to focus on to optimize its function yeah. right yeah and just for the benefit of our listeners when she mentioned dysbiosis is really an imbalance between the healthy bacteria and the in unhealthy you know microbiomes right <clears throat> and well that and it could also be, you know, low stomach acid. Yes. Um, well, actually, and, yeah. And, and digestive enzymes not, you know, yeah, being absolutely. I just want to make a mention. Yeah. Um, I'm currently studying a lot around GERD and um, LPR, which I'll talk about later. Um, the what we call silent reflux, or they're also calling respiratory reflux today. You can look that up for our listeners. But um, you know, something that I was reminded of through my training is that all our food, whether it comes in a can or a bottle is acidified for, for shelf life, right? And that acidification really wreaks havoc on our gut, you know? And so we want to, you know, that's just a little tip. <laughs> like, we should eat anything out of a can or anything out of a bottle. Now I know that's not always practical, but just keep that in mind. And I'm really conscious now about, you know, making everything from, uh, cause I'm, got my body in a bit of a healing state. So I'm eating everything, whole foods, pure, nothing out of can or a bottle. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. Let's move on. So, um, what are some common signs and symptoms that our gut health is impaired and not at optimal performance? Now I should also state that we're probably going to from time to time repeat ourselves and that's okay. I'm of the belief that repetition, especially when we're talking about things as important as this, can be a good thing. And hopefully we'll distill it, say it a different way that it really, you know, connects with you and has an impact, a lasting impact. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are some signs? Well, again, digestive issues like bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux, poor digestion, new, poor nutrient absorption, right? Um, food sensitivities and discomfort from eating certain foods. I mean, um, there is a strong connection that we're finding now between um, the LPR, the silent reflux and, um, you know, allergies, especially in, in the sinuses and that. So, you know, it's, as I said, it's all interconnected. 
cognitive changes, increased anxiety, depression, brain fog, you know, our skin problems, um, autoimmune conditions like due to intestinal permeability, which is leaky gut where, um, Melody, would you like to explain what leaky gut is? Uh, sure. I'm just, I guess at a very, very high level, uh, leaky gut tends to happen when, um, you know, we have a very, very thin thin protective layer, uh, the microbiome through our intestinal tract and things like poor food quality, poor digestion, inflammation, um, really start to damage that. And it, we are supposed to have, you know, some level of permeability because that's how our food nutrients get absorbed. But when there is chronic inflammation, um, these, this, this junctions of the villi, they call it the villi, it's like these little hair like, um, these little hair like things, you know, that looks like, you know, they, they should open and close. Mm -hmm. They tend to stay open, um, maybe too long or too open and undigested food particles can get through. And so these undigested food particles, when they get through into the bloodstream, right. the body, the immune system starts recognizing foreign matter. And so there can be a, an immune response to those things. So whether it's sensitivities, whether it's, you know, full blown allergic reactions, um, it tends to contribute to more and more inflammation in the body as well. Yeah. And when there's leaky gut, there tends to be leaky brain. As well. <laughs> yeah, I like so, that. Oh, again, I've never you know, heard of that. The connection yeah. between everything here, right? Leaky gut, leaky brain. I don't think I've heard the leaky brain concept before, but it makes sense. Actually, it makes sense. So, you know, things like unintentional weight changes, um, frequent infections or illnesses. And again, for those like myself who had <laughs> continuous bouts of sinus issues and colds and flus, and back in the day, what did their doctors do? They put us on antibiotics, right? Knowing full well now that, you know, unless it's bacterial related, which most cases is not, it's viral. Antibiotics are just destroying our microbiome and doing nothing more for us, right? Um, you know, cravings for sugar and processed food. So if you're craving that, if, in all chances, it may have something going on with your gut, you know, and you know, imbalances. Uh, even things like bad breath or, and, and a whole host of other undesirable conditions. Um, any other signs or symptoms, Melody, that come to mind or you want to speak to? Uh, yeah, I think those um, signs, particularly like cravings for sugary foods, carbs, and that sort of thing, um, when they're like really out of control and ravenous, those are one of the indicators potentially that some of your so unfriendly bacteria or the not so helpful like candida, candida. Um, are in too high a proportion compared yeah. to more of the healthy bacteria. Yeah. So, you know, we look at all kinds of symptoms as that can be somewhat related yeah. or indicators of what might be going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, things like sleep disturbances, right? Uh, kind of experiencing that myself. Oh, well, um, that, think about that, it just for a second there, Lisa. If serotonin is primarily made in the gut, and that's not happening enough, okay, and, and we're lacking that serotonin that's used primarily in the daytime. Mm -hmm. At night, that serotonin is converted to melatonin mm -hmm. required for your sleep. So again, like, you know, we're looking at upstream and downstream impacts right. that affect all kinds of things that you don't wouldn't necessarily think are related. Like, how yeah. can my gut health be related to poor quality of sleep? Well, this is how, right? Yeah. And then, you know, for those of us in the post-menopause or menopause period, it just adds another layer of complexity. Oh, yeah. There's top. other hormones impacted, too. That's a whole course. other yeah. podcast down the road we'll do, right? <laughs> for uh, female executives. Yeah. Not just one, not just one hormone. There's, you know, the, the what is the orchestra of something like 50 different hormones. Yeah. And like, they operate like an orchestra. Yeah, when absolutely. Some get thrown off, others get thrown off, too. And that's also where stress, you know, yeah. if you've got high chronic stress. Um, you know, your, your adrenals are working over time, your cortisol levels are high, you're going to, you know, in, in use like more sugar and or glucose in your, in your bloodstream, which then impacts how much insulin needs to get released. And, and it becomes this, you know, wild cycle um, of ups and downs and extremes that, you know, this is where, you know, people could be experiencing the mood swings, right? Yeah. If their blood sugar drops too low, you know, they might get angry. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there goes that yeah. carb yeah. craving again. Yeah. So it's a uh, really vicious circle, right? 
Yeah, and I want to just um, continue on. As I said, there will probably be a little bit of repetition, but that's not a bad thing. So, you know, um, as we said, when there's altered gut microbiome or microbiota, you know, we get that increased gut permeability, the leaky gut that Melody talked about, right? But, you know, what's important here is, again, is to really underscore and emphasize that stress plays such a crucial role in shaping the gut brain connection, um, influencing our digestive health and our mental well being, right? And there's so there's a real interplay. There is a real interplay. And um, I just want to read out something here because I want to make sure I get it correct. But, you know, in terms of the physiological response, when faced with stress, the body activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, HPA axis, releasing stress hormones like cortisol and nor norepinephrine. So elevated cholesterol, or sorry, elevated cortisol levels can adversely affect our gut function, leading to changes like gut motility and permeability. Now, I just want to speak because I can speak at large about gut motility. So gut motility is when our food sort of stagnates, stagnates in our belly, stagnates in our intestines, and it just stagnates for a number of reasons. Because again, maybe we're stressed, the vagus nerve is not agreeing, you know, with what's going on and um, things just shut down, Right. And so then, you know, we can get food stagnation, which can lead to a lot of fermentation in the belly and a lot of gas and burping and belching. Um, that food then takes longer getting into our intestinal system and then it can stagnate there, you know. And then again, if we got leaky gut, all those food proteins that shouldn't, that are not properly digested, right, and should be going on out through our intestinal system can maybe pass over into our bloodstream through that leaky gut, through that permeable membrane in our intestinal system. So there's a lot, there's a lot at play here. Um, you know, as Melody talked about the neurotransmitter imbalances. Um, yeah, there's just so much. And so, um, you know, it's little wonder then, right? <laughs> that so many of us are chewing on Tums 24 seven or taking proton pump inhibitors or, you know, um, taking the H2 blockers, the acid blockers, right? Like Pepsi. Well, whatever. Exactly. And I think, you know what, if, and I, I remember when I was doing my CSNN training and learning, you know, the fundamentals about how digestion works, you know, starting with chewing, starting with yeah. paying attention to what you eat and how much you need to chew your food and rest and digest that whole concept. Yeah. I mean, I never had heard that concept before Yeah, why you need to do it. You know, if you're in a stress mode, okay. Think about the initial stress, you know, you're running from a bear. Yeah. The last thing your body is going to pay attention to is whatever food is in there that needs digestion. Yeah. If you're in a chronic stress state, the alertness of your eyes, the alertness of your ears, your brain, um, sending the glucose to your muscles to run. Like these are the, this is the stress response. Your body doesn't know that you're not running from a bear. Sure. Yeah. It chronic stress is chronic stress. The yeah. physiological stress response in the body and the brain is the same. And yeah. so it cuts off literally it, it stops the digestive process while you're in chronic stress mode. So think about, you know, I remember years ago, you know, when I was in my chronic stress <laughs> corporate life, you know, we ate on the run I know. in front of our computers, in front of our devices. Yeah. In front of, yeah. I mean, I think one of the worst things ever invented was the drive throughs for oh. fast food, because yeah. I mean, this is, you know, people stopping yeah. to pick or up again, speaking to our, our, I was gonna say our audience of executives, right? I mean, for those mm -hmm. who coach how many tend to eat in their meetings or just wolf. I mean, I have it all the time. They literally wolf down, no disrespect or judgment, but they wolf down their meal. Literally yeah. in the five minute period, they might have, if they get five minutes between meetings, Zoom meetings yeah. or whatever. And, you know, and, and one, one thing I was reminded of again from our training, and I did some more, you know, training around digestive health recently with uh, some leading experts in this field. And, uh, you know, he said himself, he said he, he had a lot of serious issues himself. And so again, you know, even us nutritionists are not immune. There's a lot of things that can come into play. Uh, my biggest thing sometimes is I take care of everyone else before I take care of myself, who knows occupational hazard, but I'm really working on that. So full disclosure, um, I'm getting much better. But you know, sometimes it's, we're better than other times, right? It's just it's life. life um, happens, but he yeah. said, like, he will not eat if he's really stressed, he will not eat, because he knows that, the food is not going to serve him. He's just going to be in a worse state if he eats while stressed. Yeah. So when we say things like 
take take five to do a prayer or just do a lot of deep breathing before you sit down. Um, a family member of mine, she would always sit and have a beer and relax after work. She knew not to eat, even prepare food until she was rested, right? Yeah. Um, not that I'm advocating to have a beer, but, you know, maybe one beer is not going to hurt you. But, um, yeah, I mean. Um, well, I think the, the whole thing, the idea being to relax, yeah. you know, get yourself into a relaxed state before you sit down to eat yeah. and know that that is going to make a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, sure, there's going to be times where our days are really jam packed and stressed. And, and, you know, this is where, you know, our coaching can come in helpful too is, you know, well, there's certain things that you can do for those busier days and times yeah. to consume foods that are easier to digest, like yes. maybe a smoothie. <clears throat> You know, so it's yeah. already, but you still need to chew your smoothie. You yeah. need to, you know, combine that saliva with it. Well, our food it, should... is, it would make it easier, and maybe just you know have a smaller amount. Like if you if you're still if you're running on empty, that's that's not going to serve you either. But you know, anybody should be able to take 15, 20 minutes yeah. even to have a, a small snack and just slow down for a few. Well, minutes. and what's even more yeah. important is to build in that time. If even just five mm -hmm. or 10 minutes, if you can go for a walk, not a run, don't you know, everyone, never want to exercise for at least an hour or two after work eating. Right. But if you can just go for a walk or just do something that you're standing, you're not like lying down. Cause it's the worst thing you can do right after eating. Right. Or going right. from meeting to meeting, just build in that buffer time to rest and digest as Melody said, so that our bodies can do what they need to do. Because one thing too, that I want to add that Melody, I think, you might have addressed, but again, for emphasis, um, you know, when we're stressed, our body, all our blood goes to, you know, trying to restore that, maybe help us get it out of sympathetic into the parasympathetic nervous system, right? It wants us to calm down. But if, if we're chasing or running away from that saber tooth tiger, the metaphor for always being in that sympathetic nervous state, um, we're taking the blood away from our digestive system, right? right. And it can't be in two places at one time. So if you're stressed, it's definitely going to impact your digestion. Yeah. Well, your body, again, it's the the constant reading of the situation around you, your environment, yeah. your whatever's going on through your brain and everything else. Your body is responding to that. Whether you're, if you're not paying attention, it's going to do what it needs to do. Yeah. So you can intentionally say, okay, I need to calm myself down. I need to just relax. I need to have something to eat so I can then later function, you know, um, at a high level again later Yeah. To, to know that that's a priority. But if you don't know how your digestive system works, you're not going to know to do that. I wish somebody had taught me that when I was five years old. I know. Um, hey, <laughs> change, well, change the world and, and all kinds of health issues. Right. You just brought to mind something that I started doing for my own healing journey is I think um, not putting a plug, no referral. If we don't get any affiliation or money from it by any means, but it's either called tummy tame or tame tummy. I'm not sure it's an app and it has um, places where you can know each day and you can go back and look at your journal um, stress you know, what supplements you took, um, the food you ate, you know, your psychological state, it, it, it's several different categories for you to take notes in. And it asks you to rate it as well. So you can go back and start connecting the dots, which is really important when you're working with a, a holistic coach like myself or Melody, because we need that data, those data points from you to help coach you and to figure out what may be happening and what's going on and how we can help you address your issues, right? Exactly. Well, and that's, you know, I think we had that turned on too when we were coaching that executive team in Ohio, mm -hmm. the, um, the app that I use, and I still use it now with my clients is, um, is better. And it has a journal tracking. So you can track your food, you can track how much sleep you got, you can track your mood, um, everything from bowel movements to like ev everything. Yeah. And that's where I use the teaching um, to, to help them learn how their body responds at certain times when it's responding better and when it's not responding as well. Because unless you learn that inherently for yourself, you just don't necessarily yeah. get it. Well, <laughs> like we absolutely. can tell you in theory, this is how it works. But and this is, yeah, oh, I love that. And it, this is why it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we're taking such pain to really, you know, repeat ourselves and explain this, right? Because like uh, my coach said, you know, when you learn, it's like when you see things, you can't unsee it. When you learn things, you can't unlearn it. And this, there's a saying, when you know better, you do better. Well, 
That doesn't always happen, but hopefully not that's perfect. perfect. <laughs> not perfect, right? Um, so, you know, things like, you know, again, we're speaking pretty, as this is an executive wellness predominantly um, podcast as our target audience. You know, again, as I said, this applies to all of us, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, but, but changes really that can help improve our gut brain health, right? Like things we've maybe talked about, eating balanced whole foods diets, staying away from acidified products that are in our cans, um, you know, even things like those fizzy, I won't name any brands, but those fizzy fruit flavor drinks and there's zero calories, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. the carbonation and the sugar, artificial sugars and everything. And oh my God, they just wreak havoc on our systems. So we think, mm -hmm. oh, it's no calories. It can't be harmful. Well, yeah, it is. Right? Yeah. It's those, uh, those artificial sweeteners have are known and there's, you know, this is not us just saying it. I mean, it's, it's definitely research um, has shown, I think, well, uh, okay, I won't name the brand in particular, yeah. but some particular more common ones um, have very detrimental effects on neurological function. Yeah. Well, yeah. even urethritol, like, am I saying that correctly? I never say that word, right? Urethritol? Oh, the alcohol sugars. Oh, yeah, the al they're different. now coming up with saying that they affect, they're affecting the heart. There's, you know, new evidence coming out there. So, yes. you know, we don't, there's no passes in life, right? There's no shortcuts. I mean, if there are, we pay the price sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, things like taking time, we've talked about these, but we'll just go over them, right? Like the mindful eating, like taking that minimum 20 minutes. And I know that's a real stretch, especially for leaders who are back to back meetings. Maybe have your assistant just literally block out that half hour time. It's it, it's non-negotiable time that you have from, say, 12 to 1 or 12 to 1230 to have your lunch. And what's so important, and this has helped me immensely. Uh, and this comes from my, uh, my trainer. He said, like, chew food to a slurry. It's almost like it should be in soup form, whatever it is. You know, if it's a piece of toast with the almond butter and banana that I have for my lunch, I make sure now that is like a slurry before it goes down. Because what happens, carbohydrates breaks down with our saliva from, I guess it's the amylase, mm -hmm. is that? And so when we do that, it takes a lot of the digestive load off our stomach, right? Especially yeah. if we're stressed, right? And yeah. then, you know, for all of all of foods, proteins too. Absolutely. I mean, think about remember, we might just think about this phrase. Your your stomach has no teeth. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not break down protein that's not well chewed. Yeah. And and if that delay, if those if the food is way too coarse when it hits the stomach and it doesn't have enough of the saliva and that sort of thing because those carbohydrates remember some of the enzymes needed to break that down yeah you know it could be you know you could easily chew in five chews ten chews and get it down it won't have enough of those enzymes to actually do the proper yeah. digestion yeah and if you're not sure how to eat mindfully do the raisin test take a raisin <laughs> or a grape piece of orange and see how long how long you can stretch out eating that. So things like, and I do this with our clients, you know, you'll have them look at it, smell it, just set the body, prepare the body for eating, receiving the food. Um, you know, maybe say a, a note of prayer and thanks and gratitude, um, or if it's a piece of meat, you know, for the cows who gave up their life, right, for us to be able to have beef. Um, and then take your time chewing it and notice the taste, the texture, the sensation, make sure it's really well chewed and then swallow it and then reflect on how you feel, you know, connect with the body and see how you feel, you know, make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, you start building these practices in and also lay your utensil down in between bites. That is so, whether it's a soup, um, if it's a smoothie, lay your cup down in between, you know, the sips, um, you know, whatever. And a little trick, one more trick we move on that has really helped me. And it might seem kind of silly, especially if I'm at a table with other grown adults, but I, <laughs> I'm i always the last one finished eating. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, me too. But I <laughs> cut my food up into little tiny itty bitty bits, just yeah. almost like I'm feeding a baby. And I do that before I start eating. And so then there's no way that I'm taking big chunks of meat into my mouth or protein or, or carbs, vegetables, or even potato or whatever pasta I have really chewed up. And that has made a huge, huge difference in helping me with my gut healing journey. 
um, you know, mind body work, like breath work, um, doing yoga. Some of my healthiest times in life is when I went to yoga regularly, uh, meditation, progressive muscle relaxation, which I try to incorporate through my day and week, um, pick up good habits. Like I took up guitar and singing and that really helps me. Um, you know, I, I never, when I'm singing, playing guitar, I never have a, a gut issue. Never, ever. Cause I'm in a good, happy place. Right. Just um, something you love, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then stay hydrated. Right. Like, you know, and Another tip, I'm giving all my goodies here, but that's okay, um, is alkaline water, right? I actually just ordered, I won't say who, but I ordered an alkaline, a very high alkaline um, pitcher jug. It's not cheap, but um, you can contact me and I'll give it to you offline if you know if you want to know what it is. But it's really, um, for those who have LPR, which is a silent reflux, it really helps to alkalize the pepsin. And I won't get into what all that is, but it alkalizes the pepsin in the throat, which is actually at the problem it's not acid it's a pepsin in our throat and esophagus that's creating the pain and burning and the lpr is where you get that burning and there's a whole host of other issues you get as opposed to the gerd which is more lower and the lower is the topogeal sphincter anyway um it's, it's quite complex but but just know that the alkaline water whether you can make it yourself uh the worst the, the easiest way sometimes is to put baking soda in some water make alkaline water but i don't like that as a long-term solution so i'm getting the um alkaline alkaline container um for me on the hydration just my quick tip yeah. um something that i've been doing for quite a while now too is uh putting quite a good pinch of celtic sea salt yeah well that's what helps alkalize yeah, the I water also as have, well. i also yeah. have an alcohol uh, more alkalizing i don't know same as yours but um water filter yeah that also filters out fluoride and yeah. some other things so yeah those they it really helps with hydration i mean if anybody wanted to do the test yourself on a hot yeah. day you can feel like you're drinking gallons and gallons of water and not feel like you quenched your thirst if you really need to quench your thirst i mean this is part of that body your body trying to you know maintain that homeostasis right it it you're sweating off more minerals yes so you but need your, the mineral. your mineral your electrolytes are depleting right very much so there are much higher needs on those days so that can really help get that water into your cells and, well, and feel more hydrated yeah now we talked earlier about sugar cravings now i just uh, i don't know if i read it i think i've come across it before but i never realized what impact it truly made until recently because i'm on a very strict diet and some nights i get hungry and i get that sugar craving taking some sea rock sea salt or maybe pink mm -hmm. rock pink and just laying it on your tongue man that totally took takes away my sugar cravings and there is i've read it before and in our training right but i never ever tried it and it it really works it really works so yeah um and, and things like you know fostering social connections right like get out mm -hmm. get let's get away i mean since the pandemic a lot of us have become very reclusive we work from home we we hide behind our device devices and that's our our social connection like get out get out back out in the community the food bank volunteer organizations need us um our churches need us like get out join your friends get together and have a game of cards we just came off holidays and played card games every night and <laughs> we laughed we left. I never had a tummy pain the whole holiday, which is a whole other topic, right? Of why when mm -hmm. we're on holidays, we never have gut issues, right? <laughs> because we're not stressed, <laughs> you know, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, anything else you want to say? I mean, there's a whole host of things and you can read them here on, we won't go through everything. Um you know, we've already addressed some, we talked about the eliminating artificial sweeteners, get out in nature, lowers our stress levels, you know, get that 15, 20 minutes of vitamin D every day from the sun, the sunshine vitamin. Uh, and, you know, maybe also just, uh, you know, we've been, been talking about um, our experience, our training as executive wellness coaches. So, you know, um, maybe reach out to us if you have questions or you think there's something that we can support you with and we can do it maybe a I'll speak for myself, a free consult and see, you know, I'm, I, I only work with um, senior level leaders and, and executives at, at this stage in my career. I'm quite busy because I have other certification programs and workplace wellness programs. And uh, Melody, um, you know, you're, I think, still open to taking clients on and, you know, yes. so. Yeah. Oh, and I do offer like a complimentary 20 yeah. minute health strategy discovery call just to see, you know. Yeah. Yeah. If if it's a good fit um yeah. to work with me and and just to help, you know, give people some 
general direction. Maybe it's yeah. just they want to understand some concepts a little bit better, but you know, I certainly love doing that too. Yeah. Now I want to mention intermittent fasting because I know that's a big topic over the past couple of years. Now, again, something that was brought to my attention recently through, a, I've done a number of courses and I've read a ton on this part of my own, you know, refresher from my earlier training and, and addressing mm -hmm. my own gut health issues um, is that with intermittent fasting, some people only eat one meal a day. And I'm of the belief that and a lot of research says that it's really hard to get all your vital, vital nutrients in if we're only eating one meal a day. Now, it's good in a sense we're giving our digestive system a break to ch chance to heal, especially if we're trying to heal from issues like GERD or LPR or, you know, SIBO or anything else. However, if we're only eating one meal a day, that's a lot of big volume food going into our tummy. And that puts pressure on that LES, that lower esophageal sphincter. And when that happens, then that acid comes up and then we start getting the pepsin come up and we get the LPR, the silent reflux and the um, really chronic stages. Oh my gracious. I'm in some groups right now. There's one group that's 40,000 people. And my symptoms are so baby and mild compared, like some people can't even drink water, but they're throwing up and mm -hmm. they've let their bodies go so, so long. And many of them are on PPIs for many years, which I, I have my own thoughts around. I won't get into here, but um, they're not helping them, you know, because from what they're saying is they're not really following the healing, the gut, the diet protocols. And, and when you're at that stage, there's some very specific that Melody and I can coach you in if you need to very specific dietary detox protocols. They're, you know, part of a, I, I'll call it the, the GERD healing protocol. And you have to be really strict and it's very limiting. Um, but within two weeks, I've been following it and my symptoms are almost 100% improved from where they were two weeks ago. So there's things that can be done, but it's it's very integrative. It's not just taking a pill. It's not just taking, you know, slippery elm or marshmallow root or ginger to heal your stomach. It, it requires a multitude of um, strategies, right? Yeah, now, it's yeah, I agree. It's it's comprehensive, but, you know, and I've, I actually, I have stopped calling it, you got to do the work. Yeah. Because you know what? A lot of it's really easy. It is. It so is. So I want to rephrase this to say you got to do the things. Yeah. There might be lots of them, but they're all like ridiculously easy, some of them. Yeah. So, you know, swapping out certain foods. You know, I mean, how difficult really is it to start paying attention to what you're eating and how much you're chewing? Really, right. like they are simple when you think about it. But I think too, you know, getting back to what you were just talking about, this intermittent fasting. I did have a client uh, a few years ago who was doing this extreme end one meal a day mm. only mm. Um, really high functioning, you know, executive. And she was frustrated. You know, she initially started losing some weight, but then it was backfiring on her and she couldn't drop any more weight. She still felt she had about 40 more pounds to lose. Oh, wow. But you know, so what that was doing for her was actually contributing more to her stressful condition. Well, your body is recognizing that so, it doesn't want to be in a starvation state, right? Yeah, that could so, be happening to her. So there might be some short term, you know, like maybe you're thinking about doing fasting for a little bit um, and you only want to eat one meal a day. That can have some benefit to, to certain people at certain times, but you have to be paying attention to, you know, you can't be in a real high stress state as well. You need to give your body that time to really de-stress if you're going to do that and let your body do the, its healing and, and detoxification. Yeah. So there is a time and a place for everything. Um, I think generally speaking, you know, intermittent fasting for most people, what's a, you know, a really helpful mm -hmm. um, time period is, yeah. you know, no food after six or seven. Yeah. Minutes. I try and do like a 12 hour period. Right. Which is yeah, 14 minimum hours. Rest yeah, 14 hours, I, I'm hearing is more, yeah. you know, yeah. and the, the longest you want to stretch it, if you're still living, especially this, you know, busy lifestyle and everything else going on, right? So I think there's a time and a place for everything. But yes, no, it's definitely helpful because, you know, your body, you don't want your body to be having to try and digest food right before you go to bed. Oh, no, you know, that's the worst. And then your body has a whole other set of jobs to do at night in your detoxification and repair work. So let it have time. To do well, that. that brings up another thing too, that many like, you know, executives, I know, um, you know, I think my daughter, they, her, her 
you know, or she's, she's with a person who's from Spain. So they tend to eat later in the night and, you know, like, <clears throat> so we're not doing our health any, any favors by eating these eight and 9 PM meals and going to bed an hour or two later. Like you want to have at least two to three, ideally three to four hours between eating anything and then going to bed, especially if you're in, you know, a chronic digestive situation, right. Uh, and got some gut, gut health issues. Um, but yeah, intermittent fasting can, can work. But again, unless you really know what you're doing, I would suggest working with a professional like Melody or myself or whomever, um, you know, to, to, to get some support with that, right? <clears throat> Especially if you're doing it in conjunction with trying to heal from another health condition. Um, and, and also one thing I wanted to mention too, in just the two weeks that I've been working on myself, my brain fog is just like when I was on holidays, I was eating a lot of sugar and chocolate, you know, and uh, because it was handy, right? And you're relaxed and you're playing cards. And so it was on the table and whatever, whatever, or you're eating late at night. And, oh, man, I was just like, in a bad way there on the end of my holidays, right? Even though I wasn't, you know, I was better in the sense I wasn't stressed, but I was putting a lot of pressure and load on my tummy by eating that late at night. So we really, um, but, but yeah, like in just two weeks, it's amazing how quickly the body can heal itself. Mm -hmm. It really is, right? And the clarity of mind. And so why is all this important? Well, you know, we're talking again, we're, we'll speak predominantly again to, um, you know, senior level leaders, executives who need to have strong cognitive function for high performance, right? They need to have that agile decision-making I mean, sometimes they have to make critical decisions on a moment. And if they can't remember something or they're in a meeting with the board of directors, you know, and they can't remember a board member's name. And this happens. We've, I've heard it mm -hmm. happen, you know, because they got brain fog or they have health issues going on related to, you know, poor gut health and everything we've talked about. Or they get stressed really easy because their body is always in that heightened state that's sympathetic and their parasympathetic is just, you know, Huh, gone to sleep, right? It can't keep up. Yeah. Right. Well, I think too, I mean, decision making, um, we all know, well, those of us in the know, we we know that you when you're in a chronic state of stress, decision making, it's not the best time to be making big decisions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. that that number one needs to be um acknowledged. But I think too, you know, again, and, and here's another example of, you know, having this more holistic perspective on your health um you know so the eating is one thing and we're talking about this gut brain connection and we've mentioned a little bit about the sleep component too but a lot of people don't know that unless you're getting really good quality sleep at night your brain repair mechanisms and detoxification process will yeah. not be working either so that buildup can start to happen it's called it's a i think it's the glia cells that yeah. do this and they're not neurotransmitters and they're not the neurons. They're actually other cells within the brain yeah. that must do this cleanup. It's like, you know, having the, the cleaning crew come in at night, do its cleanup and repair work so that you're refreshed for the next day. Yeah. That again, if you're not getting sufficient sleep, yeah. if you're, you know, not giving yourself, your body that time to relax and recover. Yeah. You know, it just can progressively. Well, the, the sleep and the whole um hormonal imbalance can affect things too like we haven't talked about the ghrelin and leptin which are you know mm -hmm. uh, neurotransmitters and enzymes and hormones and everything else that go on in our body that you know signal satiety tells us we're full or you know tells us that we're hungry and you know so everything just goes out of whack right it really does go out of whack and as executives, we need, you know, we need to, and I know I, I have, I, I have a global business and I'm, I'm very busy like yourself. And, you know, I need high energy. I need uh, high stamina, right. And I need to have my mental acuity. Um, and uh, I can honestly say, um, even actually putting, I'll just use this as an example, putting together this presentation, I did it so much more quickly than I normally would. Things just came to me and I realized, Oh, wow, I don't have that brain fog. I'm just so much sharper and more focused, right? Um, and I credit it again to this healing path I'm on, right? Oh, no, I can totally relate as well. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll share my story later as well. But yeah, yeah I, I've experienced that. Yeah, well, how about you share your story now? Uh, this is a good time maybe to, to share a little bit about, you know, what you've experienced before and where you are today in your health journey. Well, I mean, yeah, I <clears throat> very... 
open about talking about it, you know, years ago, and, and we're talking now probably, you know, well over a decade ago as well. I mean, I had been in Toronto and I had some very, very fun, but very stressful career opportunities. And I, like, I didn't know anything about health. You know, I mean, I, I was really, you know, one of those people that definitely, you know, it was go, go, go. You know, our, some of our mottos were, you know, work hard, play hard, you know, sleep when I'm dead, you know, that kind of thing. So not taking care of sleep, not really, not that I didn't care about my food. I mean, I really liked food. In fact, I really was quite a foodie, but it wasn't about, um, I didn't know what I didn't know mm. about just how much toxicity there is in a lot of processed foods and yeah. sauces and cooking methods and, you know, ratios of macro and micronutrients and a lot more carbs and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, it really started to build up. Okay. And so between the chronic stress, I think, and the poor nutrition and, you know, lack of sleep and a whole bunch of things, but progressively over time, and this was actually progressively over the course of 15 years, I developed a lot of chronic pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in my mid thirties and oh wow, you know, like early thirties, mid thirties, when this was really starting to, to ramp up and it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And I was, you know, didn't help matters. I was kind of mis misdiagnosed, told, you know, this was just my spinal issues because I had scoliosis um, as, a, as a teenager and, oh, that's just what happens later in life. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Really? Really? And so the painkillers were adding up. Right. And, which affects you know, your gut microbiome <laughs> which I didn't know you mm -hmm. know not to mention like they all affect your liver and that's yeah. your major detox organ hello so I mean it just was a slow progression over time and just the the worse it got the scarier it got mm -hmm. and I honestly thought this cannot be from scoliosis I mean I'm feeling pain everywhere this isn't just you know my spine and it, it started getting really scary. And after going to, you know, numerous different, you know, health experts and getting massage and physio and chiropractor, like, I mean, I was spending over $5,000 a year wow. and not feeling better for more than like a day. And I wasn't even feeling great. Because they're like, some of them are band-aid solutions. Massages are great, but they're not going to cure you from what's really it, bothering exactly. your body. Exactly. It wasn't addressing the root cause. Yeah. yeah. And so... When I got the download of like, I need to look at something about nutrition. I didn't know what that really meant, but I, you know, found CSNN. Yeah. Which is a Canadian School of Natural Nutrition. Yeah. Right. It was my first exposure to hearing anything about mind, body, spirit and natural health. And I'm like, well, what is this? How can it? And so, I mean, I was, I was really at the end of my rope and I was pretty desperate. And uh, I decided to enroll in the course and just see what it's all about. I mean, I, I thought I had tried everything already. And so this was my first sort of window into looking at sort of natural health and nutrition and, and just trying to figure things out. And, and I tell you, like every class, every day I went to class blew my mind. Light bulbs I mean, were going know, off, right? <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to find the energy to do it because I was so depleted and still working full time, you know, barely. But um, it was the, I, I still attribute it. It saved my life. Yeah. And, and, me too. Learned, I, yeah. and what I learned too, was I, I did learn about the concept, of, you know, in the pathology class is when I, where I learned about fibromyalgia and I checked off all the boxes. Right. And so I took that back to my doctor thinking, Oh, right. You know, maybe she'll have something for me then. <laughs> Let's just hear some more painkillers. Oh yeah. That's probably, yeah, that's it. You know, I mean, it was so nonchalant and I'm thinking, um, Okay, well, now I still got to go figure all this out. So it, it did take me a couple of years to pull all the pieces together. But, you know, for a lot of different disease progression development, it's it's a slow over time progression. And until it reaches a threshold where things are so bad, mm -hmm. you don't you don't get a proper diagnosis. And then if you're all you're offered is, you know, a medication that really doesn't address the root cause either but it's masking a symptom you're not dealing with how to keep your body yeah. so i am so grateful and i say this every day 
um, I to figure out the pieces. Let's just say I've cracked code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know how integrative all of these things are yeah. in in the food quality, the you know help supporting your body to do its detoxification, yeah. getting you know the hormone balancing, fixing the gut. I'm telling you, I had a lot of repair work to do there too because of all the pain killer medications I was taking. I mean, and it all came together. And over time, I mean, the first three months I was at CSN, if I ever told you this, um, I cut my pain in half, wow. started sleeping better and lost 25 pounds. Yeah. Like I wasn't, that wasn't my goal. No. All I was doing was cleaning yeah. up a few things I was doing. Yeah. And, and it just gradually things improved. So this isn't rocket science, but there is a lot of little things you can do that well and you know right? yeah and i bet to uh, maybe ask that um and i think i know your answer perhaps but for our audience our listeners um when you feel like potentially because we all have those weak moments like you said we're at parties or whatever like we talked about earlier and gravitate into overeating or eating the extra cookie or piece of cheesecake or whatever i bet you think back to that period and how much pain you're in because, you know, and, and and let me just say this too, like, you know, and I bet that's a deterrent then from going back to maybe all ways of eating. Now, that's not to say, like, let's, you know, what we try and do as coaches is help crowd out the unhealthy food, the processed foods with healthy foods. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that occasionally, you know, you can't have your favorite treat or maybe once on the weekend, but the rest of the week, you know, like we want you to live because we all want to yeah. enjoy life and enjoy food, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, if you're in a healing phase, yeah. you know, you need to be more strict about yeah. things. And yeah. I don't like to be, be restrictive and hardcore like you can't have. Yeah. I mean, everybody has to make their own decisions at every moment about what they're going to put into their body. But there's alternatives but, and like fun, healthy, yeah. good alternatives as well, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. And and they're not difficult. They're oh. just, you know, yeah. it's every, everything is a choice. Yeah. And so... You know, I don't have to be nearly as restrictive now. I mean, I can even eat sourdough yeah. bread again, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and some, some people will say, oh, if you're fibromyalgia, you, you can't have gluten. It's like, well, actually that's not true. I know there's so and many so things yeah, when you heal that body, it can basically take back a lot. I mean, I, one of the groups I'm in for GERD, um, you know, the recipes we share are like incredible and you don't have to deprive yourself even on the, the, the detox period, the healing, the really strict healing period, there's ways that you can, you know, you got to be in the kitchen a little more, right? Or have someone cook for you or prep for you. And God bless my husband. He makes all my healing soups <laughs> and that. But I, I get in the kitchen when I have time because I do enjoy it. I find it actually quite relaxing, right? Um, but let's just talk now about, you know, and wrap up about the emerging research and trends in the gut brain connection. So there's a lot happening on this front, you know, and I, I won't go too deep into here, but um, I, I Actually, my aunt, bless her soul, she's no longer with us. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but she was having a lot of gut issues. And she actually uh, did some fecal transplant. It wasn't probably as sophisticated a way as they do it. But, you know, what they're doing, they're finding is that they're taking uh, feces from other people that are really high in, you know, all the healthy bacteria. And they're transplanted in people and it repopulates, right, in your intestinal system. The, the bacteria, um, you know, you can do it through pro probiotics. I'm more of the belief that, you know, the kimchi, the sauerkraut, the kombucha is a better way because they're fermented foods and they tend to, you know, work a little better. And 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 you got to be careful with probiotics. You want to, you know, be careful what you're taking and know what you're taking because sometimes you can do more damage and more harm than good, right? Um, when you're manufactured probiotics. Um, but, you know, impact of artificial sweeteners that we touched on, um, the importance of sleep. They're finding more and more evidence around the sleep gut connection, right? The impact of having social interactions, right? If you look at any of these over in uh, the blue zones, um, you know, the, these 100 year, 100 year old plus people, right? They have such huge social interactions that, you know, it's key to their longevity and, and their health, right? The environmental influences. So we got to really watch that. And yeah, like, I mean, all the additives that are in our food now, oh my gracious. I mean, as I said, um, and I kind of knew this, but I kind of, I guess I forgot, you know, like the fact that all our food is acidified and that's that acid food contributes to or impedes healing when you are in a chronic state. And let me tell you guys, 
you don't want to get yourself there because it's way easier to keep yourself out of a chronic health state than, you know, it can be done. You can heal from it, but it takes so much longer than it does to get ourselves into that. So if you can listen and get something out of what we're talking about today, or if you have concerns or issues, work with a health coach like ourselves or, you know, whomever, um, you'd be, you know, ahead of the game for sure, right? Yeah. I always want to touch on those environmental influences as well. I, I think, you know, we'd be bring us to omit the impacts of um, EMF, EMFs, the radiation, where mm. the in absolute increases of um, exposure to this radiation. And there are tens of thousands of studies now that have yeah. shown um, the detrimental effects on our mitochondria, our cells, mm. the leaky brain, like all of those things. But it's also... Um, you know, the blue light, yeah, blue light exposure from our screens. I mean, how that impacts melatonin and your sleep. Yeah. There's, you know, the other environmental conditions too, like, you know, the air quality, the amount of sunshine you're getting, yeah. the, and let's not forget other environmental, you know, toxic chemicals, whether it's agrochemicals or maybe your nearby manufacturing facilities, mm -hmm. like there's- Or other living in our provinces where we have fire- wildfires burning for yeah. six to eight months of a year you know yeah. <laughs> we're in neighboring yeah. provinces here in canada in alberta and saskatchewan and i mean i just looked at the map there's like hundreds up to yeah. 300 you know and then bc so we've got bc alberta saskatchewan all have you know wildfires since climate change whichever way you cut it and so all to say mm -hmm. that we don't have the luxury of just neglecting our bodies because we've got so many, and not to put, you know, to be too scary here, but we've got so many environmental factors and forces that are want to just, are that are robbing our, us of our health. So right. we have to do well, everything yeah. we can yeah. to keep ourselves healthy. Yeah. I mean, like compared to like two or three decades ago, like there's just that much more for yeah. our bodies to have to, you know, cope with. Yeah. And so we do need more tools and more insights and education and support and how to do that. I mean, it's just not something, you know, you're taught growing up. <laughs> so, you know, like, like I said, our when I fathers, my... you know, we you talk to our fathers or our parents, that, well, we didn't have those issues. Well, you had a much more pristine, clean environment, cleaner food, you know, probably in some regards, less stress. They all know they had their own stress levels, but yeah. sources. I mean, but, unless you're in, in certain industries, of course, like, I mean, even yeah. farming, like I remember hearing my dad tell stories and my grandparents, you know, they used to have human markers. Did you know this? They used to put human markers in the fields where they were doing the spraying to show like where to start and where humans would stand in the fields to show like, okay, stop over here. And I mean, these are like, you know, some of those chemicals at that And they time may not have really had toxic. when equipped up with masks or anything, right? <laughs> yeah. No. And how many farmers do you know have like stuck their entire arms in a tank to stir things? Yeah. And they're saying, oh, no, it's fine. It's like. It's full of Roundup, <laughs> right? <laughs> you wonder why there's, you know, epidemics of, um, no. you know, diabetes and Parkinson's yeah. and, and that sort of thing with yeah. more senior farmers, right? Yeah. Like you want, you have to look at that and say, uh -huh, it's an yeah. issue. <laughs> well, I think this is a good point then to probably wrap up. And um, again, I just want to say uh, for the record that, you know, we're here. Um, there's a lot of people out there that can help you. And if, you know, um, I'm a big fan of uh, conventional medicine. I think they really serve their purpose when you're in an acute state go to your doctor go to the emergency if you have a something that's not feeling right you go see your doctor but when we're talking chronic long-term things unfortunately conventional medicine you're just not as well equipped they don't have the time the resources maybe even some of the training they're just trained differently right There's so training, that's yeah. where yeah that's where you want to reach out to people and it takes a while and they don't have the time or the bandwidth either to you know, they lucky if you got 15 minutes with your doctor these days. So, you know, things that are longer term. Yeah. Yeah. You want to, you want to, you know, reach out and get the, the professionals to help you. Right. Um, so 
Uh, thank you, Melody. This has been a lot of fun. I, I knew it would be, and we we could go on for an hour or two, but we don't want to. <laughs> oh, we just scratched the surface. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, maybe we'll have you back and we'll talk about some other or continue the conversation, right? But uh, we'll, we'll wait to see what the feedback is from people to our listeners. And certainly to our listeners, if you have some thoughts around topics or you know, expansion of certain topics, let us know and we'll, we'll have a, a second episode. And um, yeah, so so that really brings us to the end of our episode. And again, thanks, Melody, for joining. You've been a really fun co-host and I love the uh, the interplay between us, right? Yes. Um, well, thank to, you for having me. I think, um, it's, you know, it's like I said, we we do have very similar training in our backgrounds and same you know, analogy. Yeah. Yeah. But, our, you know, our experiences with our own personal health challenges has been yes. different. But I think yeah. it just also goes to show, you know, a lot of the same similar yeah. things that you start paying attention to really do make a massive difference in yes. the healing process. Yeah. And, you know, to, for the number of times I've had, you know, even my mom's doctor, like, look at me and say, like, you're nuts. Like you're crazy. How can that matter? We don't understand. Cause from, in fairness to them, they just, just trained, haven't so been trained. They haven't got the yeah. education and there are some really progressive integrative doctors out there. Right. And I've trained under them. Uh, but some, unfortunately others are not. Um, yeah. So to our viewers and our listeners, you know, again, um, please remember, as I said, the information provided is for educational information purposes only. Um, and I would just want to bring your attention also to the screen or if you're listening, um, certainly if you are interested in, you know, connecting with Melody or myself or any of our other um, executive wellness coach graduates to support your health and well-being as a senior leader or executive um, we have a variety of programs, one-on-one -on -one and group programs that can really, you know, and, and um, some of us are have different degrees of training. Melanie and I have, have very in-depth training in the gut health issues and a whole other host of issues uh, that maybe some other executive wellness coaches, you know, so you really want to meet and interview and find out, you know, who's a good match for what your, your needs are, right? And we also have... Um, an upcoming certified executive wellness coach course which is starting on september 23rd 2024 so you can go to our website workplacewellnesscoe.com to learn more about our coaching services and our new uh enhanced newly enhanced uh executive wellness coach program so i think that's all for today folks you know certainly be watching for future episodes we come out once a month and, um, you know, give us some feedback, like us, rate us. We, we welcome all the feedback. And most importantly, you know, do try and take one or two things you've learned today and put it into practice. And you'll, you know, you'll already be putting yourself on that healing journey, right? Most importantly, again, is just be kind to yourself, okay? Uh, be kind to your body. Keep it real and keep on moving. And, you know, our bodies, it's the only one we have. So we have to take care of it, okay? So Jim Rohn, I think that's a Jim Rohn quote. I, I love that one. Yeah. yeah, and please yeah. share share this podcast. Yes, with someone, you yes. Know, thank you. Who maybe you know having some health, ch you know, challenges, struggles, or who's highly stressed out and that sort of thing. I think it's so insightful just to kind of start scratching the surface of just how many ways you can actually support your health. That's very simple to do, very easy, and makes such a massive difference. We don't have to be sitting in silence. We don't need to be struggling. You know, your body is intended to heal. So let's help it get there, right? Okay, guys, take care. Be well. Bye for now.